Welcome everyone. This is our Healthy Lifestyle Program webinar series. Today, the title of our webinar is Addressing Poor Sleep and Insomnia. We have um, the honor of Daniel Hall, Dr. Daniel Hall with us today to present this topic. He's an assistant professor in psychiatry from Harvard Medical School, associate director of program utilization and evaluation research, health promotion and resiliency intervention research center at the Mongan Institute, a staff psychologist at MGH Behavioral Medicine Program and Center for Psychiatric Oncology and Behavioral Sciences. And my name's Amy Sinclair. I'll be moderating the webinar today. I'm a health and wellness coach with the Healthy Lifestyle Program. I have a few opening items and then I will pass it to Daniel. So this webinar will be 45 minutes. We're gonna do about 30 minutes of the presentation and then we'll do about 15 minutes for Q&A. The webinar will be recorded. Your video and audio are off and cannot be connected. And we encourage you to ask questions through the Q&A feature or by sending a chat to host and panelists. So please send in your questions. All right, so I'm gonna take down my screen and I will pass it over to uh, Daniel Hall. All right, thank you so much, Amy. Um, it is a an honor to get a chance to speak with you all this afternoon. And I'm really hoping that through my presentation, it will generate some interest, some questions, and hopefully some motivation for all of you um, who are struggling with sleep to get in touch with resources because at MGH, we're very fortunate to have several available options to follow up on sleep and sleep-related concerns. All right, and I'm going ahead to share my slides. Great. Amy, that looks good. Fantastic. Uh, I'd like to begin by sharing a little bit of a background about sleep and insomnia. Um, many of us have a night or two of poor sleep throughout the week. That's, um, even though that can be really upsetting when that happens, it's not uncommon and usually isn't clinically impairing. But when sleep problems persist, and they are chronic, meaning they're lasting at least three months or more, then typically that's meeting levels that we would call chronic insomnia. And insomnia can be a result of many, many, many different factors. But if it's uh, primarily due to something else like a pain disorder or um, something else like sleep apnea, then that would be a secondary insomnia, but most often insomnia is diagnosed as a primary sleep condition. Uh, primary insomnia is diagnosed as the sleep condition. Um, insomnia at chronic levels is very, very common with one in 10 adults in the United States having levels of chronic sleep difficulties. And so if you're one of the folks who's viewing this video and watching today um, and you're you know struggling with sleep unfortunately you're in good company um, there are many 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 other folks who are struggling with sleep um, there are some risk factors that make us more or less likely to develop insomnia throughout our lifetime um, we know that older individuals are at higher risk for developing insomnia and there are a variety of reasons for this some are psychosocial, some have to do with genetics, um, and others have to do with our metabolism and processes of aging. Um, there can also be more interrupt interruptions at night related to incontinence or um, taking medications, for instance. And so that's one reason why as we get older, we tend to have a higher, higher risk of poor sleep. And then there are some changes with our circadian rhythm uh, as we get older as well. There's some uh, research on sex, on biological and role gender uh, related differences between men and women, for instance, where 
women appear to be at higher risk for developing insomnia and having chronic insomnia. Um, and there can be the presence of things like anxiety or depression, pain, fatigue, and these can impact insomnia and how much sleep we're getting at night. Um, often what happens during the day carries over into the bedroom. And even if we're not at work anymore, our minds and our bodies might still be at work. Or even if we're not thinking about managing illness anymore, our bodies are still in the middle of it. And so often having a comorbid medical illness or psychiatric illness is a risk factor for insomnia. Um, I also listed cancer on here. A lot of my clinical and research work is with adults affected by cancer. And after diagnosis of cancer, the risk for insomnia goes up three to five fold. And so uh, the estimates are about 30 to 50% of cancer survivors have chronic insomnia. Um, if you're wondering whether you might be appropriate for uh, or for for addressing sleep, if you're wondering whether your difficulties with sleep are worth bringing up with your doctor, if you're wondering, hey, should I say something or is this just something I should work through on my own? Well, I would encourage you to say something. Uh, some of the optimal guidelines around cancer survivorship care, but also around lifestyle medicine, encourage routine screening of sleep, meaning your clinicians are supposed to be asking you about your sleep health. And if they're not asking you, then I would encourage you to bring this up with them. They may ask you questions are about falling asleep, either difficulties falling asleep, staying asleep or waking up. And if so, that's about insomnia. Um, they may ask about some other sleep disorders. So they may ask you about excessive sleepiness or times where you're just feeling excessively tired and sleepy. Um, and that might indicate the presence of an organic sleep disorder potentially uh, hypersomnia or um, narcolepsy. You may also be asked about snoring. Um, many, many, many uh, folks who struggle with sleep are at risk for obstructive sleep apnea and snoring or um, having periods where you're having difficulty breathing, these are common signs of sleep apnea. And sleep apnea really requires a referral to a sleep specialist for treating. You'd wanna get fitted with a CPAP machine or um, an equivalent type of device to help, uh, help you breathe continuously. Um, there's just some statistics on this slide as it pertains to NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers which are meant to really be providing some of the optimal care for cancer survivors in this country. And even in these centers, there's fairly low rates, there are fairly low rates of cancer survivors being asked about sleep. And so it's just to say that even though the field is progressing, and I've seen it quite a bit over the last few years, there's more and more awareness about sleep as a common issue, an important issue. Even still, sometimes clinicians won't always ask, so I encourage patients to bring it up. Um, if, in fact, you do have insomnia, the good news is there is an evidence-based treatment available. The evidence-based treatment that's supported by most research is called CBTI, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. And it's recommended as a first-line treatment by the American College of Physicians and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. It consists typically of an intake session where you'd meet with a professional, usually a psychologist, but it may be um, any other type of behavioral health clinician. And they would ask you about sleep, but they may also ask you about um, how are you doing overall? And how is sleep impacting you and those around you? Because that's an important 
aspect of treatment. Um, after that intake session, you would then complete typically between four to 10 sessions. And these sessions are usually around 30 to 60 minutes. And during those sessions, you'll be learning about um, any combination of these five skills. Now, most programs, you'll be exposed to all five of these skills, but sometimes a program will emphasize a few of these over other ones. So there can be some variation, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, CBTI is efficacious and effective, meaning it works very, very well in comparison to control arms. It works better than sleep hygiene for improving sleep. And we see these very, you know, usually moderate to large effect sizes um, that are fairly robust. Um, so that is sort of the psycho babble statistical jargon for saying these interventions usually work well um, and often have a big impact on improving sleep. So even though it sounds great, right? This sounds good. Everyone's recommending it. Sign me up. However, <laughs> CBTI can be challenging. Um, there are some parts of the skills, some parts of attendance and adherence that can be challenging for patients to attend, and it can be challenging sometimes to implement. Um, on this slide, I try to summarize what I view as some of the pros and cons of different ways to access insomnia treatment and skills for improving sleep. Right now, some of the most common ways and most studied ways to receive CBTI are either in person on the left or remotely using apps and websites. Um, now, often when I'm presenting in front of a live group where I can see the audience, I might ask for a show of hands. Who here has heard of a sleep-related app or website? And more and more and more these days, I see hands going up. People are aware that there's sleep-related apps out there. Um, and these apps have enormous um, pros and cons. So just to walk through very quickly, um, you know, in-person care is fantastic. We know that the research um, shows that the highest effects, the biggest improvements so far have come from um, in-person delivery types of programs where patients get, you know, that rapport, a lot of tailoring. And oftentimes when we start talking about sleep, we uncover other things going on in someone's life and fears or concerns that might require tailoring. Um, however, there are some major logistical concerns and constraints. Uh, for many, many, many folks, it's just not practical to travel downtown or to a, a clinician who is you know, trained in CBTI. Um, and it can be very, very hard also if you're managing a medical illness to um, maybe even physically to be moving around and it can take extra energy and cost. So there are some challenges with this and there aren't that many trained CBTI providers, although that's increasing. There are more and more providers these days. Um, and certainly around Massachusetts, we have a network of CBTI providers throughout the state um, and, th and in MGH specifically. But in general, this is often a, a, a major challenge. Um, apps and websites can be a wonderful introduction to learning some of the skills I'll share in a few slides, but you know they don't offer the same type of tailoring, the ability to learn about you, your unique patterns of sleep. And if you're having any preferences from the past, um, you know, these are often a more of a cookie cutter type of approach. And uh, there's some research that they don't yield quite as large an effect on improving sleep. Um, at MGH, 
in the last uh, two years, two to three years, we've been developing a very short version of CBTI that has a participant workbook, a facilitator's guide, and it's all digital, all electronic. Um, and it's meant to be a little bit of the best of both worlds, of the in-person where um, in-person and the, on the left and then uh, accessing remotely on the right, if you might remember. Here in this program, we offer virtual therapy where you meet with a therapist in real time, you meet with them over Zoom, and they would work with you over four sessions to learn each of the five skills and give you an opportunity for getting that one-on-one -on -one attention that we know uh, can be really, really important. This can also, um, this could be delivered individually or in groups. Uh, some of the research that we've worked on here at MGH has tested this short protocol, this four session program. And what we found is in comparison to a control arm where people got uh, enhanced usual care, which was uh, a handout on sleep hygiene and a referral for CBTI in our hospital. In comparison to that, um, half of the participants had received this four session program. And we found, again, these large and sustained improvements in insomnia severity. And we saw similar patterns of improvements in sleep quality, sleep efficiency, and sleep onset latency, or how long it takes folks to fall asleep. And so um, a lot of this work has been empirically demonstrated in other study and um, in other hospitals and other settings. And at MGH, now we're um, rolling out versions of this program clinically and in future research studies. So I'd like to shift their attention now to providing an overview of the five core skills of CBTI. And this is meant to be just an introduction for each of these skills to really do them justice, I would probably require a lot more time. And uh, there are nuances for each of them I may not have a chance to fully address, but I just wanted to provide an introduction. So the very first skill of CBTI, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, involves stimulus control or improving your stimulus control. And what this concept is based on is the principle of conditioning. So for those of you who may remember Pavlov and Pavlov's dog, um, maybe from the psychology class from high school or something like that, Pavlov, Pavlov's dog learned that when it would hear a bell, it would salivate. And it learned to anticipate a reward of food. In a similar way, our brain can elicit sleepiness in our body when we look at our bed. When we look at our bed, it can become a signal or a stimulus to make us sleepy. But it can only do that if we only sleep when we're in the bed. Once we start doing other things in bed, then the bed no longer becomes a stimulus to make us feel sleepy. So what we try to do is make sure that every time you look at your bed, you get really, really sleepy. And the best way to do that is to work backwards, to have you take out all of the activities that you're doing in bed aside from sleep and try to figure out some creative way to get you to maybe engage with those activities outside of bed. So again, there are some nuances to this skill, but that's the overall principle. Sleep number two is, it sounds really scary, but it isn't. <laughs> it's called sleep restriction. And really what we're restricting isn't sleep. We're restricting your time in bed. Many people with insomnia have fragmented sleep, which is represented up here. There are periods where they're asleep and periods when they're awake. And 
this isn't ideal for a lot of reasons, including it makes it harder for you to cycle through restorative and those deeper stages of sleep that can be so helpful for our immune system. Um, what we aim to do with sleep restriction therapy is we look at your total time that you're asleep and work with you on a goal to restrict your time in bed to the total time that you're sleeping. And we'll gradually, gradually, gradually increase your time in bed as your body has learned to maintain sleep con continuity or continuous sleep. And so this is a very slow and gradual process. And I think it's best done with, uh, with a trained facilitator who can work with you to set reasonable goals that work with your schedule and make sure that you're not spending too much or too little time in bed. The other thing I'll mention about sleep restriction is there are some contraindications for this particular skill. So in order to do sleep restriction, um, we need to have um, the ability to block off a little bit of extra time in our schedule, anticipating we may have a few days of feeling really sleepy. The other thing that's really important is to make sure that a patient does not have a history of mania or seizures or an acute psychotic disorder that isn't well managed. And the reason is because um, being sleep deprived can trigger um, an episode of mania or psychosis for some people who are at risk for that. And so if you do have a history of mania, or uh, seizures or uh, psychotic disorder, you would just let your therapist know and they might do a modified version of this um, to keep you safe. Um, skill number three is sleep hygiene. And this is the technique that many people are familiar with. These involve sort of general do's and don'ts about your bedroom environment um, and include including um, temperature settings in the room that you can change or setting the clock around so that you aren't able to see it, trying to limit napping in bed and limit um, other types of activities that could make it difficult to get restful sleep. So drinking alcohol or caffeine in the afternoon or evening that can affect our sleep. So this is important, but Sleep hygiene alone won't treat insomnia. So if you've been trying these techniques and they haven't been working for you, instead of um, doubling down or saying, you know, I'm removing all alcohol or I'm going to, you know, not drink any coffee at all and try that, what I would suggest is maybe trying some of these other skills first and seeing if they work better for you than working really hard to change one of these activities. But if you're looking for a place to start, everything on this list can be um, a great step in the right direction. Skill number four is relaxation. Relaxation is wonderful to do right before bed to help prepare the mind and body for restful sleep. Relaxation is also great to do during the day because we carry a lot of our stress from the day into the bedroom. So if you're able to manage your stress throughout the day through a little bit of relaxation and you'll have less cumulative sleep to deal with at night right before you're going to bed. Um, we teach a variety of relaxation techniques that help prepare the mind and body for rest. And there are different ways that relaxation practices work, but they work wonderfully and actually even if you only did relaxation and no other skill that I'm talking about today, you probably find benefit in insomnia. Relaxation training alone works better than controls, control arms um, in randomized control trials. So this is a powerful technique to use.
Okay. And the final skill of CBTI is what we call cognitive therapy techniques. Oftentimes, if someone's had insomnia for much longer than three months, they've developed some expectations about the sleep or the bed where it really feels combative, like it's you versus the bed or it's you versus your sleep. And this can be a really challenging dynamic to have. Often we enter the bed um, with certain fears or expectations about sleep. So we try to address some of those mis misconceptions about sleep or maladaptive or unhelpful ways of thinking about sleep. Um, sometimes people use the night at the nighttime, the bedroom as a place to, st uh, to worry, to think about to do's for the next day. Um, what we try to do is we work with patients to um, limit their time thinking about to do's for the next day um, until the next day. So we might work with you to develop a worry time technique, a worry time routine where you're worrying, but not in bed. Instead, maybe you do it in the morning or you during, during the day you set aside some time to think about your to do's or worries. And then if they come up at night, instead of thinking through and trying to problem solve in your mind while you're awake, um, try to get back to sleep and bookmark your worrying for the next day. So I'll end with sharing a few resources for anyone who's interested in connecting more around sleep and insomnia. At MGH, we have uh, two referral pathways for getting access to CBTI. Uh, the first is through, I'll say, uh, is, I should have really flipped these. The first is through MGH Psychiatry and the Behavioral Medicine uh, Sleep Program. We have a direct referral pathway through EPIC, and you or any of your care providers are welcome to request a consultation where you could meet with a psychologist or psychology fellow and have your sleep assessed. They would ask you some questions in a virtual session. And if you do qualify for the program, uh, they would meet with you virtually over um, a period of a few weeks. Also, if you have a history of cancer, um, usually within the past year or so, then you may be eligible to receive uh, your services of CBTI through the MGH Cancer Center. And we have a center for psychiatric oncology and behavioral sciences that includes some psychologists on staff who can deliver CBTI. Um, if you are uh, wondering whether you, uh, if you're interested in sleep study or you're considering you know, testing for obstructive sleep apnea or restless leg syndrome um, or another organic sleep disorder, you may contact the MGH Division of Sleep Medicine. And also in the Cancer Center, we have an integrative therapies program that does offer some complementary uh, practices for addressing insomnia and, uh, and acupuncture, which is now an evidence-based therapy for addressing um, insomnia as well. So that's another option. Um, there are a variety of tools out there. There are lots of apps. Um, some apps can be helpful for a therapist who wants to collect, you know, uh, um, sleep diaries and work with you to share materials remotely. And so for any of you who's working with a therapist, you might like to get in touch um, with any of these resources, they're welcome to. I also recommend um, a variety of apps that are listed here for an initial exposure to learning more about sleep-related treatment. For some people, they find that these apps are sufficient and they like the ease and flexibility of something that's, um, you know, that you can do on your own. You know, for the reasons I explained earlier, for many, many patients, they're interested not in an app or a website, but in meeting with the therapist one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so for those uh, individuals, I would encourage you to ask for a referral.
And uh, with that, I'd like to acknowledge our community partners and my uh, research team, and most of whom are volunteer research interns, and uh, thank uh, also the DGIM and Healthy Lifestyle Program for sponsoring this uh, webinar. All right, thank you so much. Um... Dr. Hall, we really appreciate you taking the time to be here. And so now we're going to transition to our Q&A portion. So please, if you're watching this webinar, you can use the Q&A feature to send in your questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming in already, so we can um, start answering some of those. Okay, so the first question coming in says, as I age, I find that quality sleep is harder to get on a regular basis. I've tried a lot of the sleep hygiene practices to no avail. Uh, what suggestions would you have? Well, um, stop getting older. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm sorry. I use humor sometimes. Um, I know it's. Um, I, I appreciate the question. It's a. It's a challenge. Um, there, there's a sleep and aging research lab at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center run. Uh, by Tony Cunningham that's dedicated to addressing this very question. Um, I, I think there are a variety of factors. Um, some are behavioral, right, and have to deal with what's going on in the middle of the night, circadian rhythms. Um, often when I'm working with older adults, they're taking medications sometimes at night um, or often will have water by the bedside is a common behavior. And um, many of us don't really need water by the bedside, or if we do, we really just need a tiny sip. But one strategy that can help with older adults is to try to limit our water intake. But um, it can be challenging. There can be some other um, complexities around managing um, other medication-related side effects as well. So one thing that also comes up with some of my older patients is um, the occasional need for using steroids or if they have an inflammatory condition, potentially chronically using steroids. Um, some patients are on hormonal therapies, um, whether it's related to cancer survivorship or their thyroid or any number of um, common concerns that come up as we get older. And so uh, they're just, they're challenges, but each of these techniques can still work you may um, just need a little bit of modification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. One other question coming in. Um, how can we get connected with some of the resources that you mentioned? Sure. Well, um, I am ecstatic that the, re that the webinar is going to be recorded. So certainly um, I would encourage anyone, if you have a PCP within MGH, that's one of the best um, ways to get direct uh, referrals. You as a patient are also welcome to contact any of the specialties. There are websites for the MGH Behavioral Sleep Medicine Program and MGH Psychiatric Oncology Services. They each have a separate website and they include a phone number and email if you're interested in a referral, um, a self-referral. There are also providers in the community and uh, myself and a number of other providers also um, have a few, we're just aware of a few options for people who are seeking care outside of the hospital. So if you are interested, um, you're welcome to email me at my MGH email address, and I'm happy to share with anyone a list of clinicians in private practice as well. Um, and my MGH email address is hall at mgh.harvard.edu. Just hall. Just hall. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> good, good. Thank you. That's so generous of you to share. We appreciate that. And yes, the webinar will be recorded. So when it's up on YouTube, you'll be able to get a, that list of all the apps and resources that were shared. So um, it will be on YouTube shortly, probably uh, within a week of this webinar. Great. 
Okay, so we have another question here. Um, it says, I have no trouble falling asleep, but wake up after four to five hours. The strange thing is I'm totally refreshed and not tired. Um, after a couple of hours, I sometimes fall back asleep. Um, but the person here is noting that they don't really feel tired. All right. Well, you know, there, so there's a range for each of us. Um, some of it is genetic is my understanding, but we, you know, our guidelines for seven to nine hours of sleep there, some people will need less sleep. And it sounds like potentially the person, you know, that, that, that for you, um, this, this may be the case. Maybe you require less sleep. Um, you know, if you're finding yourself falling back to sleep after a few hours, um, there's a chance that even if you feel alert, you would benefit from retraining your body to have all of that sleep consolidated into one segment. But um, it sounds, it, you know, so I, I, I've worked with someone um, whose optimal sleep was four hours and I was pretty skeptical. Usually the minimum um, that we would work with someone around is about five hours or so in bed. And so, um, but everybody can be a little different. What I would ask for maybe the person who wrote this question is whether you're having a big, that's a huge impact in your day. You know, is it, is it upsetting? Is it impairing your ability to go to work or connect with your friends and family? And if so, um, that may be a challenge. You can have insomnia, even if you have difficulties waking up too early. And that's the only challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the answer. I think we have time for two more questions. Um, if you could talk a little bit about the connection between mental well-being and mental health and sleep, that would be really great. Sure. There's a huge, so sleep is one of those um, concerns that is about the body and it's about the mind. Um, sleep and sleep quality is really self-reported. Um, and it's, one of those areas, just like similar to pain, similar to fatigue, there's a subjective experience of our sleep and how we report on it and how we experience it. And so there's a lot of overlap when it comes to depression and anxiety. Um, there is a lot of comorbidity, meaning patients with depression. Um, are at high risk for developing insomnia and patients with insomnia are at high risk for developing depression. Um, interestingly, research has found that when patients have both insomnia and depression, they benefit more from receiving CBTI, sleep-related treatment, than from receiving um, CBT for depression first and then addressing sleep next. And so sometimes I think when you're overwhelmed or feeling anxious, feeling stuck, feeling depressed, um, it can be really, really difficult to focus on changing your thoughts and other patterns of your life, but working on your sleep can feel concrete and, and actionable. We usually work with people who start noticing improvements in their mood fairly quickly. Um, and there's even some research showing that pleasure and positive mood can be one area that strengthens in our brain, our ability to experience pleasure and process um, anticipatory joy and our expectations. It, that area of our brain and our emotional processing changes in, um, as our sleep improves. And we see those same areas implicated in depression treatment. Um, for also, for some patients, there may be some short acting anxiolytic medications that they're taking off label to deal with their sleep. And that's really a challenge that I would need to work with them as a therapist and that they would want to work on first. So in other words, taking like a benzo uh, 
in order to go to sleep because you're feeling really anxious or worked up. Unfortunately, that's fairly common or having a hypnotic potentially that's being used off label for managing a mental health concern. Those things can also impact our sleep. So we take a look at your medications, but it's very common that anxiety and depression co-occur. Thank you so much. Okay, final question. Um, I've seen different videos across social media talking about the vagus nerve and applying ice onto the chest as a way to kind of help with um, a moment of insomnia or trouble falling asleep. So could you speak to the connection between the vagus nerve and um, insomnia? Sure. Yeah, vagal nerve stimulation is a very powerful way to induce the relaxation response in the body and the mind. Uh, the vagus nerve, the vagal nerve is the chief nerve of the parasympathetic branch of our nervous system, which is, um, it calms us down in contrast to the fight or flight response. And so it's a very powerful way to relax. I don't know about specifically with, um, you know, frozen peas and, you know, and sort of the that direct type of stimulation. Another way to get a similar effect is with deep breathing. So diaphragmatic breathing um, is a very powerful way to stimulate uh, the vagus. So the vagus nerve goes right up through our diaphragm and every time as we breathe in and then when we breathe out, if we can really contract our belly inward and um, you know, sort of squeeze our diaphragm, we're gonna get a big, um, a big um, bump in our vagal tone that can do the trick too. And so I'd encourage folks maybe to try some deep breathing before the ice pack, but the ice pack um, could help. Just hopefully you remove it uh, before <laughs> before you wake up. Um, otherwise you have maybe a cooked meal the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Great tip. Um, thank you so much. That's yeah, I love how you provided a lot of ideas and skills and things for people to try out as well as resources. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's been watching and sending in your questions. We hope we um, answered them. And I'm going to share a few closing slides, just so everyone knows a few other resources. Okay, so closing items. Um, we love your feedback. So I'm actually going to put into the chat. Okay, here it comes. So there is a link in the chat right now that will go to our feedback form, our feedback survey. If you could fill it out, we really appreciate it because we want to hear what ideas you have, what other topics you want to learn about. So please put it on the feedback form. And when you submit the feedback form, there is an option to sign up for our quarterly newsletter. So you'll learn about other webinars and other programs that we're running. And we also um, run virtual group visit programs. And so I wanted to just share a snapshot of the schedule here. So when you fill out the feedback form and you click submit, it's actually going to link right to our website as well. And let me actually put our website right into the chat, grabbing the link. Okay, so here's our Healthy Lifestyle Program website. So you can see here we have different topics. We have stress reduction, um, prediabetes, hypertension, and so on. We have brain care. We do have some groups on sleep. This is just a snapshot here that I wanted to share. So lots, lots of resources um, that you can take advantage of within the MGH system. Okay, so I'm going to stop my share. And again, I want to thank um, Dr. Hall for being here with us today. Thank you so much for sharing all of your valuable information, your resources, your skills. All of that is super valuable for our patients. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and uh, for raising awareness about sleep. All right. Take care, everybody.